Welcome to Dementia Matters, a podcast presented by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our podcast is here to educate you on the latest research, caregiver strategies, and available resources for fighting back against Alzheimer's disease. I'm your host, Nathaniel Chin. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Dementia Matters. Last week, we spoke with geriatric psychiatrist Art Wallacek about identifying and managing mental health issues in older adults. This week, we continue our conversation with Dr. Wallacek and turn our focus to the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, also known as BPSD. If you missed last week's episode, I encourage you to go back and listen to that conversation. In the meantime, here's the show. Now, in people with dementia, they may exhibit more severe, more noticeable personality changes than depression and anxiety, and I know you were alluding to this earlier. So in the medical community, we refer to these changes as behavioral or psychological symptoms Mm -hmm. of dementia, so BPSD. Mm -hmm. So can you explain for our listeners some of those other common BPSD symptoms that patients may experience? Yeah, absolutely. And these are often the ones that... Um, are distressing both to persons with dementia and especially with their their family members. So we'll, we'll go with psychosis here. So psychosis has two main categories. There are hallucinations, so that's seeing or hearing things that aren't there. Um, so more commonly seeing than hearing. And um, sometimes this can be a clue in terms of what the type of dementia is or certain types of dementia are more likely to have hallucinations. And specifically, Lewy body disease related to Parkinson's disease, those folks are more likely to have visual hallucinations, often very vivid, very detailed. The person can describe exactly what they're seeing. Um, Often not distressing, but sometimes potentially can can be quite frightening and, and distressing. Um, So those are hallucinations, seeing or hearing things that aren't otherwise there. And then there are delusions. So that's believing something something despite there being plenty of evidence that that is not true. Um, So the most common things there in Alzheimer's disease are believing that someone is stealing from you. And often the way you get to that is the person with Alzheimer's disease or dementia due to Alzheimer's disease has forgotten where they put something. And for some reason, their brain says, oh, someone must have stolen it from me rather than I misplaced it or I, you know. So um, that's the most common. Um, After that comes the belief that you're not in your own home anymore. And that may be that you just, you don't recognize it. So five years ago, you moved from your home to a condo or from your home to a senior living community. And now you're having memory problems dating back 10 years. And so you've forgotten that in that intervening span of 10 years, you've actually moved. And so this can come across, it can sound very paranoid, like, you know, you've moved me. Why am I not in my own home anymore? And then particularly distressing to caregivers uh, can be delusions of infidelity, where a person believes that their loved one is having, having an affair on them. And uh, what's tough about delusions is you can try to convince someone until you're blue in the face, and that's the nature of a delusion. It doesn't change even with presentation of facts to, to the contrary or evidence that, that it isn't the, the case. Uh, other delusions include things like, you know, I'm, uh, my pills are being tampered with, my uh, uh, food is being poisoned, people are watching me, people are trying to break into the house, they're trying to kill me, et, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be very, very distressing to patients and certainly to caregivers too, especially when accusations start flying around theft or infidelity or things like that. Now, every once in a while, a caregiver is stealing or doing these things, and so that can be a little tricky to sort out sometimes, but most of the time, it's, it's in fact a, a delusion. Are you more likely to see these hallucinations or delusions later in the disease versus earlier? It, typically later, although, you know, something like dementia with Lua bodies or Lua body disease, they can show up fairly early on. They can be among the initial presenting symptoms of the, of the dementia. But at, you're absolutely right. It's typically more moderate or severe stages of dementia where we usually see hallucinations and delusions. You know, one of our previous speakers on the show had said that the symptoms of BPSD are often a way for someone with dementia to express themselves. And maybe it's not a healthy way for us, but it's their way of communicating. And they said that because often we're not sure what to do for treatment. 
So how do you how do you respond to family members who are experiencing BPSD? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's a very powerful explanatory model of what's going on. There are other models, but I do like that one quite a bit. Um, it's called the unmet needs model, and so basically the person has a problem of some sort. They're in pain, or they're constipated, or they're hungry, or they're bored, or they're lonely. And because of their dementia, their usual skills that they would have to express those things and get help, like, you know, go take a Tylenol, for example, if you're in pain, or, you know, talk to your doctor about constipation, whatever, those usual tools are not available to them any longer because of their cognitive impairment. And so it instead comes out in this other way that, you know, they're trying as hard as they can to let you know what's going on, but it's coming out as aggression or agitation or depression or anxiety or one of these other BPSD. Um, And then uh, the trick for the caregiver and often the challenge is trying to decode what, well, what is going on here? Is this pain? Is this constipation? Is this loneliness? Is this a medication side effect? Trying to, trying to sort all that out can become tricky. And the reason can change over time as well. So you may have it figured out and then six months later it turns out there's another issue now that's causing that. So I think it's a powerful model and it, um, it changes the dynamic a bit from a behavior that's a problem uh, that must be eliminated to a communication on the part of the patient that we need to respond to as caregivers, as providers, and and so on. Um, so I, I, I think it's a great model, and I think it's a way of, it can empower caregivers as well to, okay, well, we can do something about this. Let's try to figure out what's going on here and then respond to address that unmet need. And speaking about that, what kinds of general approaches, treatment options do you give family members when they leave your clinic and they want to be ready for a BPSD symptom and they don't want to use a medication? Yeah, absolutely. So there are lots of wonderful resources out there. So there are great book and online resources. So like the classic book is uh, the 36-hour day. Um, And so that's been in through many editions now. It's a bit of a read. It's long. And so that's kind of the issue. How do you get a a stressed out, burnt out caregiver to read um, a big book? The beauty of it is you can sort of dip in at the the section that you need. And so there's often lots of great advice in there. Um, the, uh, uh, there are many organizations around, including, uh, the Alzheimer's Association and in South Central Wisconsin, the Alzheimer's and Dementia Alliance of Wisconsin, both of them offer caregiver support and education groups, tremendous level of wisdom in those groups. So often there are caregivers there who have taken care of their loved ones for many years. And so they've kind of seen it all and they can share their wisdom with newcomers to the group. And it's just a place for support and validation as well, that it's a really hard road as a, as a caregiver, in addition to just the, the facts that, that come out of going to one of those uh, groups. There are groups where both the person with dementia and their caregiver go so they can both learn. Um, lots of great online resources as, as well. Um, different communities will often, will offer different levels of social services as well. So, uh, uh, in Wisconsin, it's senior centers and aging and disability resource centers. So different communities will offer different things, but often they'll have groups and other educational activities there to, to learn more about how to manage these things. You know, I often will tell family members, it's really trial and error, Mm -hmm. because like you just said, the disease evolves, and so our approaches have to evolve, Mm -hmm. and so it's really a matter of brainstorming. Have a a couple of things that you like to go to, but understand that it may not work the next time, and just keep trying. Yeah, it's, um, I love the analogy of jazz, you know, it's, it's improvisational, so, I mean, it's, on the one hand, it's really frustrating because you may have have it all figured out and then three months later, whoops, we're back to square one. But if you maintain 
I mean, it's sort of, uh, it's an attitude of like, all right, well, we'll see what today brings. And maybe what we did yesterday worked fine, but, you know, it's not going to work today. So we need to come up with something else. And the challenge is we're asking caregivers who may be depressed themselves, who may be anxious, who may be exhausted because they are up every night with their loved one. We're asking them to implement these things and to main flex, maintain flexibility. They've got their own stress threshold that is deteriorating over time. So, um, that's where reaching out to get other supports from family members, friends, professional paid care- caregivers can be really helpful because none of us can you know, can do 24-7 uh, caregiving without, without burning out. Now, without using the name of any medications, mm-hmm. what do you say to people who ask about antipsychotics mm-hmm. with behavioral symptoms? Yeah. Well, it's a tough decision because... Um, uh, all the antipsychotics are associated with pretty significant side effects, including death. So every single antipsychotic says right on the label, you know, FDA black box warning, do not prescribe these medications to older adults with dementia. I mean, it's pretty clear right there. And, and the reason for that is because there's a higher risk of dying when someone is prescribed one of these medications versus when they're not. Now, we still prescribe these medications, so how is that? Well, um, I kind of think about it a little bit from a palliative care point of view. So what are we trying to maximize here? Uh, The person's life, how many days, weeks, months, or years they have left, or their quality of life. And um, uh, uh, in some circumstances where the, the behaviors are so dangerous or so distressing where it seems like, all right, we, we really should be focusing on this person's safety, on their quality of life. Um, that might be a scenario where we might prescribe an antipsychotic medication, watching very, very closely for side effects, including sedation, falls, uh, uh, dizziness. Uh, it can affect how people move. It can make them sp- stiff and kind of look like they have Parkinson's disease, even though they don't have Parkinson's disease. Uh, there's a there's a whole litany of potential side effects that we have to watch out for. And, and this, is, this part gets a little tricky, um, surprisingly, there's often a big placebo response, meaning we think the drug is working, but it's not. Something else has happened. Either you're paying more attention to the person or the symptoms have just passed. Sometimes we see symptoms come and go, which again, it can seem a little odd that someone who's got really significant behaviors, three weeks later, the behaviors are just gone by just watching and waiting. But that is in fact sometimes what happens. And then three weeks later, the behaviors might be right back again. Because of those things, we don't really know if the med has worked or not, even if it looks like it's worked. So usually we recommend taking the medications off, tapering slowly after about four or six months, something like that. Very, very difficult to convince folks to do that, especially if it seems like the behavior has gotten better as a result of being on the medication. But all the risks are still there. And the longer the person is on it, the the greater the the risks are with with the antipsychotics. So it's, you know, we have to do a very careful risk-benefit analysis. And all the treatment guidelines say don't use antipsychotics unless... Non-medication things have tried, have been tried and have failed, and there's either a major safety problem, like the person's going to hurt themselves or hurt someone else, or they're just so terribly distressed, say, by their, you know, their fear that someone's going to kill them, uh, their, their paranoia. So um, it's, it's, it's a challenging business to, to pick, pick one of these medications. And it requires quite a lengthy conversation mm-hmm. and yes. a needed conversation with your healthcare provider. And it's often not the person themselves that's making that decision. They may not have the ability to fully reason their way through that, through the risks and benefits. And so then you're often talking with a family member who is a guardian or an activated healthcare par of attorney or some mm-hmm. other you know, next of kin. And that person's then involved in the decision making which then makes it trickier still to uh, uh, you, you to be even more cautious then about you've gone through all the steps of, of informed consent. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you for being on Dementia Matters, and we hope to have you on again. 
Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private, university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Abishir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.